Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno. Today we talk border issues and how they impact the economy in our region. Joining us is John Barella. He is CEO of the Borderplex Alliance. John, thank you so much for being with us. That's great to see you again. It's great to be back on your show, Anthony. Long well, time no see. Huh? It's great to have you back <laughs> on. Uh, obviously, there are many important issues that we can discuss here today. I want to start off, though, with President Trump, the Trump administration, ordering hundreds of custom and border protection officers to be relocated to deal with the surge of migrants crossing the U.S.-Mexico border and turning themselves in in El Paso. How has that impacted the flow of goods and services across the border? Well, right now, unfortunately, we are still seeing wait times that are unacceptable. There's about an eight-hour wait time uh, for many businesses. Uh, even under the best of circumstances, the wait time issues have been an impediment to maximizing and optimizing border trade and border trade efficiency and securing the border. Uh, best of case scenarios, usually a two to three hour wait. Um, good news is that wait times have been reported to have been reduced from 12 to 24 hours earlier, a few days ago, down to about six to eight hours, but that's still unacceptable. Uh, there are businesses operating at 30% capacity. Um, I feel for the CBP officials, the hard work and the courageous work that they do trying to accommodate and adjust to this migrant and humanitarian crisis, so I get it. Uh, but we all need to be working together to come up with short-term, but more importantly, longer-term bipartisan solutions. Now, President Trump has also announced uh, in recently that he will close the U.S.-Mexico border if Mexico doesn't do enough to deal with the surge of migrants. Uh, coming up north and uh, to the U.S. What are your thoughts on how that would impact the economy in our region, or the, just our region in general? Well, closing the border would have a devastating impact on our region here. The important point to also make is it would not only be devastating for us, we're close to the border, some obvious symbiotic economic relationships with Mexico, but closing the border would have a devastating impact on the entire American economy. Five to six million American jobs rely directly on trade with Mexico. Matter of fact, the second most impacted state should the border be closed would be Michigan. 138,000 jobs in Michigan rely directly on trade with Mexico. 700,000 jobs in the Midwestern states of Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. 700,000 jobs just in that Great Lake region rely directly on trade with Mexico. In our region, our region being defined as Ciudad Juarez, Doniana County, and El Paso County, our region has moved to become, in the last 18 months, the fourth largest manufacturing hub in North America. Some 300,000 manufacturing jobs uh, are located in our region. So closing that border would have a devastating impact on the manufacturing sector, the warehousing, transportation, logistics sector. The retail sector would also be very adversely impacted. It's been estimated that between 15 and 30 percent of the retail trade that takes place in our American side of the region comes from Mexican citizens uh, shopping and dining and doing other leisurely activities here on our side of the border. So clearly that would have a devastating impact. One last thing to say about this, Anthony, though, even just the threat of closing the border has a chilling effect on commerce. Words have meaning, and uncertainty is the enemy of jobs, investment, and economic development. And unfortunately, just the threat to close the border creates that uncertainty. Well, let me hear a little bit about what people involved in businesses uh, are talking with you about. You mentioned the chilling effect. So what are they worried about? What are their concerns? Well, over the last uh, week or so, I've heard from dozens of businesses who have invested in our organization and runs the spectrum from retail establishments to manufacturing to those involved in the logistics trade. And they are simply saying that these wait times are having a very adverse negative effect on their business. Uh, 
One business uh, just today said that they're operating at 30% capacity because they cannot make the truck turns. Typically, they will have three so-called truck turns where there will be uh, three round trips of, of loaded cargo from Mexico coming to the United States and returning. They're down to one uh, because of the wait times. And these are the types of stories that we're hearing across the board uh, with, with these uh, increased wait times. I mean, communities have responded. Uh, Ciudad Juarez uh, put porta potties uh, on the other side of the border to help truckers. And uh, what are some things that you've seen uh, communities do to help try to alleviate uh, this wait time? Well, first of all, I have to compliment the CVP in their efforts to try to deal with this crisis. So there's been a good communication flow, first and foremost from the CVP to businesses as best as they possibly can. So uh, I don't wanna be critical of the law enforcement efforts that they are making. They're put in a very, very difficult position. Um, as far as the short-term uh, help and solutions, I know uh, Mayor Margo in El Paso has deployed resources to try to help uh, the situation. Uh, I know uh, Mayor Cabada in Ciudad Juarez is also deploying his municipal resources to help alleviate some of the, the difficulties that are transpiring. But Anthony, the key thing is, is that this has been a problem and now a crisis that has been decades in the making. Uh, we have been saying in the border region, those of us who are from this area, that the federal government has to make the appropriate investments in port of entry infrastructure improvements. And that simply hasn't been done. And so now we're starting to pay the price for a lack of investment that has not taken place by and large in our ports of entry, especially along the southern border. And that's going to adversely affect American productivity, potentially American jobs. And we, of course, always say that border security and facilitation of legitimate commerce, those are not mutually exclusive concepts. Now you bring up uh, border security and enhancing the border to um, make these ports of entry up to date. How do you find the balance with having a secure port of entry for CBP agents to be able to, um, you know, do their job to protect the port of entry, the border, but also ensure that you can have a timely crossing of goods yeah. from the border for businesses? We need to give the CBP officials every resource that they need in order to make sure that our borders are indeed secure. Humbly, I would suggest that the uh, $5 billion uh, that was originally requested by the administration for a border wall uh, would have been better utilized uh, for a $5 billion investment in our ports of entry along the southern border. So how do you Let feel me, about that, though? Like, how do you feel about the border well, wall with President Trump's proposal? Well, I, I, I've been fairly open about it. I, I appreciate efforts to try to secure the border once again. But in my humble opinion, it is the most antiquated and most expensive solution to uh, se securing the border. Anthony, I keep saying that, that, that immigration, migration uh, is a multilateral, multidimensional challenge. And to try to do it unilaterally uh, is, is a mistake and I think a waste of taxpayer resources, in my humble opinion. While I appreciate the efforts, it's simply not going to work. But back to the ports of entry, I, I posit the notion, and these come from data, CBP data, that 92% or so of the illegal drug trade that comes into the United States from Mexico comes over our ports of entry. Likewise, the overwhelming majority of the undocumented migration that occurs in our country doesn't occur in the middle of some desert location, hundreds of miles away in the middle of nowhere. It, in fact, comes across the ports of entry. Half of the undocumented migration that we see in the United States are visa overstays. Fact of the matter is the migra migration crisis that we see from Central America and now from Cuba, increasing number of Cubans, are being apprehended at the southern border, the overwhelming majority of those, well over 90%, are not trying to cross in some remote desert location. They are, in fact, coming to the ports of entry and declaring themselves uh, open for asylum relief. So, again, a wall won't solve those issues, it won't solve those problems. Six billion dollars of investment into our ports for technology, additional personnel, additional lanes, uh, other improvements in our ports of entry will not only facilitate this legitimate uh, commerce, create jobs, make our countries more uh, efficient and productive, but will also go a long way towards securing the border. 
Now, CBP uh, has, it's been reported that they want, they want to build a massive processing facility in El Paso. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been folks in the community of El Paso who have spoken out against this. Business leaders uh, have also spoken out against it. How do you and your organization feel about a processing facility, a large processing facility being built in El Paso to deal with the surge of migrants? Well, to clarify, uh, the business community and the political leadership in El Paso are not opposed to a processing center. Uh, they are opposed to the processing center that essentially is being pinpointed in an industrial center, which is a very inappropriate location for that processing center. But let me be clear, the business community, uh, most of the political leadership uh, in El Paso County support a humane and dignified solution to this migrant crisis. We need to treat these people with utmost respect. Do you think that's uh, been done so far? Uh, I mean, we've seen um, migrants being, you know, stacked underneath uh, a bridge during, you know, weather conditions that may be cold, uh, children, families. Uh, do you think that was humane? No, of course not. And, and that's why we're calling for uh, those of us in the business community, uh, an alliance of, of business people, are calling for a humane approach that would ideally be a purpose-built facility that would uh, temporarily house these migrants and do it in a way which affords them the dignity and respect. The problem with the way the, the GSA offered the RFP for the processing centers was basically pinpointed to one warehouse in northwest El Paso, which I think inherently would have meant another McAllen situation where you are housing them in very inhumane conditions, uh, at best putting partitions up and temporary uh, washroom facilities and all of that. And I understand the crisis. It's a very, very difficult situation that we're in. But we need to do this in the right way. We need to open up the geographic scope of the RFP so that multiple locations can be considered and taxpayer dollars can be saved. And at the same time, we make sure that we treat these people with, with respect and dignity. So how does that impact business along the border, folks who may want to expand their business or people who are looking at the border with this migrant crisis going on and with the president of the United States, you know, calling this region, you know, almost like a lawless area, you know, like we're almost being, you know, he, he's, he's spoken very negatively about the border region here in, in our area here in southern New Mexico, far west Texas, the, all across the southern border. So what does that do for business along the border? People who want to invest in the border. Well, Anthony, I've been very passionate about speaking out on this issue for decades, and it's not a, a recent occurrence, but for decades, pop culture, for example, we've been movies, miniseries, television series, we are always portrayed as a violent, lawless frontier, unsophisticated place. Sometimes we're portrayed in less than flattering light our culture, and that's just a fact when we see movies, TV series being made and filmed in our area. Good, bad, or indifferent, the pop culture has morphed itself now into policies in Washington, D.C. that take direct aim uh, at our region. Uh, we are, in fact, not a violent, lawless frontier as the narrative, both in pop culture and political debate, goes these days. Um, we brag among the safest communities in America. El Paso is the safest city always in the top one or two uh, for decades uh, in terms of cities its size. Las Cruces, by comparison, also has a lower crime rate than cities uh, very similarly sized throughout America. See, that Juarez's per uh, capita homicide rate is lower than that of places like Detroit and Baltimore and, and St. Louis and, and other American cities, including Birmingham, Alabama, according to the latest statistics. Yeah, they had problems years ago, and it's still room for improvement in Ciudad Juarez, but it's a lot better than what it was. My point being is that notion, that perception that somehow we are a violent and lawless frontier puts an artificial limit, an artificial ceiling on our ability to get businesses to expand and relocate in our area because that invariably comes up when we try to recruit businesses to the area. And in my past life as cabinet secretary for New Mexico, we always had to confront that when we were looking at locating businesses that were either in Santa Teresa or even here in Las Cruces. 
So it's, a, it's an extra challenge that we have. Uh, it's part of what our organization does is yeah. to try to rescript that narrative to tell the truth about the crime st statistics and data. But make no mistake about it, when there is this false narrative being created out of D.C., it doesn't hurt us. Or, so, excuse me, it doesn't help us. It so hurts us. What is the question you get asked the most from businesses in, interested in the border? That are not familiar with our area yeah. is, are you a safe community? What are the crime statistics? And we course have a, an array of data that we provide them that uh, debunks that that false narrative much has been also made um, you know around the State of the Union address I know you spoke out against what President Trump said about El Paso being a dangerous city before a, a wall or a barrier was up mm -hmm. uh, on the border uh, when you heard those words from the president during the State of the Union address how did that make you feel I mean what were your thoughts it was, of course, disappointing to hear that because, again, the facts and the data point out that before the wall was built, El Paso had a very, very safe record. Uh, it was across the board safe uh, and uh, especially on serious crime was uh, outperforming its peer cities uh, by a large measure in terms of safety. The subliminal message was that somehow the border fence was uh, a silver bullet and was uh, the magic elixir that transformed El Paso into this safe city when in fact it had always been safe. So in that respect again it was a false assumption that uh, that wall somehow equated itself with, with, uh, with safety in that city. Um, what I will tell you is I've talked to CBP officials, uh, those agents that are actually on the ground every single day and what they'll tell you is that that fence uh, creates choke points where you're able to manage the flow a little better. Um, but those same agents who are on the ground will also tell you putting a fence in the middle of nowhere is not a solution. Uh, but in fact, we need to be investing in technology, more personnel, and uh, other resources that would better secure the border. Now, we've seen, um, obviously, the growth in Santa Teresa. We've seen uh, Southern Park in southern New Mexico start to develop a little bit. El Paso has seen quite the resurgence in recent years. Do you have any concerns about what's happening right now on the border, uh, it, preventing that from continuing to grow? You know, that's somewhat the silver lining uh, to all of this, this uh, teeth gnashing that's going on about the border. Our organization right now has a record number of leads for job expansions and relocations in our region, which is very gratifying across the spectrum of business sectors. Uh, so despite uh, all of this uh, rhetoric that's going on, all of the debate, uh, our region being in the crosshairs of this very vitriolic uh, rhetoric, is the fact that we are still a resilient economy here, uh, especially, uh, I have to tell you, uh, see that Juarez's unemployment rate uh, is below 4%, according to official government statistics there. And El Paso's at full employment, and Doniana County's unemployment rate is still uh, coming down. So the good news is we're a resilient area. We continue to create jobs. And I just wish, uh, not to sound greedy, I wish we could do more. And, and, and we are trying to do more. Uh, but, the, but the false narrative, again, uh, limits and puts an artificial ceiling on, on our optimization of job growth. I, I've talked to some executives in different companies uh, along the border. And uh, yeah, they've had some concerns. Also, uh, recently we had a uh, vice president from Dell, uh, who they obviously have a big investment here uh, along the border as well. And one of the things that was told to me was that people in Washington aren't hearing what's really happening on the border. Yeah. Do you think that's true? Absolutely right. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the biggest expert on the border these days are people that it, uh, have had their obligatory photo op for one or a couple hours at the border fence or alternatively never been here. And those of us who have grown up on the border, who are natives of this area, who have spent time on the border, understand and, and are frankly perplexed by the assertions that are made by uh, certain individuals in Washington. Uh, and we have to get beyond the rhetoric. We have to get beyond the talking be beyond one another. Uh, there has to be some sort of bipartisan dialogue, some civil discourse that will finally take place in order to solve our problems that 
that we are seeing now. We gotta solve them in the short term, but more importantly, come up with some long-term solutions. And it's uh, it is frustrating. Uh, I'm in Washington quite a bit. I'll be there next uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, testifying in front of uh, a committee, and uh, we'll be taking data to the committee members and. And hopefully uh, we can embark upon the, the real work of, of coming up with solutions. Well, speaking about solutions, uh, there's been a lot of folks working on a trade deal with Mexico <laughs> and the United States. Yeah. I don't think it's any secret that President Trump was not a fan of NAFTA, you know, as a, as a candidate and also as president. And he announced a new agreement. However, we haven't really know what the final, we don't really know what the final agreement is going to be, I guess, right now. Um, do you have any concerns with this, with the trade wars, with the tariffs, things going on? I, I'd like to hear your perspectives on really that. Well, I believe that Mexico is an economic and strategic ally of the United States. It's not a foe. As I mentioned earlier, between five and six million American jobs rely directly on trade with Mexico. Trade is not a zero-sum game when we talk about trade with our southern neighbors. Uh, the rhetoric, uh, the disrespectful rhetoric about Mexico, I think, is, is disappointing. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, in my humble opinion, NAFTA has been a unparalleled success for both countries. Uh, the USMCA, I think, is an improvement upon NAFTA in many respects. I think that we will continue to work hard to make sure that uh, this USMCA is passed. Uh, I am more optimistic today than I was a couple months ago about its passage. Uh, there's growing bipartisan support for its ratification uh, in Congress. And uh, that's one of the things that I'm going to be doing on behalf of our organization in the region. We'll be uh, advocating very hard for passage of, of this agreement. And that's part of the reason I'll be back in D.C. as well in a couple of weeks. So we're working with coalition partners throughout the country, uh, the agricultural community, our peer organizations on the northern border. We do have two borders, after all, and, uh, and other, other trade associations. So we're, we're optimistic we may be able to get this through. Does the fight over a border wall, border security, impact these, these discussions and agreements? It does. Uh, it, it's a distraction. Uh, it's, it's a it creates a pall or a cloud over uh, the bilateral relationship that we have with Mexico. Uh, I don't believe it's the, uh, as I said before, it's, and to repeat, it's, it's the most antiquated and most expensive uh, solution, if it is a solution, to uh, our, our migration issues and the illegal drug trade that takes place. So, um, but yeah, it casts a cloud over, over the overall debate, uh, and at best it's a distraction. Uh, at worst, it, 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 it really does scuttle uh, what is a very positive economic relationship uh, and, 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 and strategic relationship with our southern neighbors. There's been uh, some hope, I, I mean, before really this whole um, border wall fight really, really occurred was cr the creation of a binational community mm -hmm. along our border here yeah. in our region. Uh, what are your hopes for that? <laughs> and I mean, do you, does that seem like something that's really far fetched right now? Oh, I don't think so. I, there, back in, I think it was 2013, was present at the uh, creation of that uh, binational agreement when then Governor Duarte and former Governor Martinez signed that agreement. And Santa Teresa, Border Industrial Association, Mavida, all of these organizations have worked, worked hard to make sure that the momentum is maintained. Uh, lots of infrastructure improvements and, and, and capital have been put into the Santa Teresa area. The fact of the matter is in 2011, uh, New Hampshire, the state of New Hampshire did more trade with Mexico than New Mexico did. Mm -hmm. And over you know, the course of at least the six years that, that, that I had the honor uh, and privilege of serving uh, the people of New Mexico in conjunction with the BIA, Mavida, and others, there were 38 jobs announcements, some large, some small, but 38 jobs announcements in Santa Teresa in those six years. It was a joint team effort uh, that was was accomplished, yeah. and, and, and we had a lot of good results on that. I'm glad you brought that up. You served as cabinet secretary um, under Susana Martinez, Governor mm -hmm. Susana Martinez, uh, economic development, and uh, you have a history involved in public service and government. 
uh, you ran for Congress, I believe, what, was 2010? That's right. As well. Um, you had to remind me of that. Well, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> but you did run. Yeah. And, and you've been involved in yeah. politics in New Mexico. So I, there was a recent announcement. U.S. Senator Tom Udall announced he was vacating his, wasn't going to run again. So there's going to be an open Senate mm -hmm. seat in New Mexico. Is that something that you may be interested in? in pursuing running for Senate? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, categorically, no. Uh, while it was an honor to run, and we, we came very, very close in 2010, uh, it was, I think, a three-point race in a very uh, tough district for a Republican. Uh, it was an honor to run. Um, I was privileged to serve on the Albuquerque Public School Board and serve uh, in Governor Martinez's cabinet. Uh, I am happy doing my job. And it's the best of both worlds. I'm in the private sector and still involved in policy, clearly. And so, uh, absolutely not. Okay. All right. Uh, John Barella, I want to thank you so much for being here and taking the time to talk about these important issues. Anthony, thank you. It's always great to see you. And we want to thank you for joining us for Fronteras and Changing America. Remember, you can always stay updated with the latest news at our website, krwg.org. Also, we want to hear your story ideas and possible ideas for this program. You can email us your thoughts and even story ideas, as I mentioned, to feedback at NMSU. Dot e -D -U. Also, we're on social media. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and you can subscribe anytime to the KRWG News YouTube program, or YouTube channel, I should say, where you can always watch this program. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Anthony Moreno. We'll see you next time.